Welcome to the latest episode of the Vatican Lies series. In this video, we move away from the subject of the first four videos on the myths and fabrications of papal authority that the Church invented and perpetuated about itself. This video will examine a more recent lie about Church history as it attempted to whitewash its complicity in the anti-Semitism that culminated in the Holocaust, or Shoah as the Jews refer to it, during World War II. In 1998, the Vatican issued a document titled We Remember, a Reflection on the Shoah that stated the Church had no responsibility in contributing to the atmosphere of anti-Semitism that swept Europe in the 19th and 20th centuries. Of interest to note is that the commission formed to study the issue and create this document took 11 years to seek nuanced ways for the Church to deny its responsibility. This methodology is not new to Church sophistry as it was employed both before and since. For example, people believe that the Church apologized for its conduct in the Galileo Affair in 1992, but a careful analysis reveals this so-called apology was yet another papal whitewash, as laid out in detail in the book Retrying Galileo, as with the 11-year commission to deny anti-Semitism by the Church, in July 1981, Pope John Paul II issued instructions to his Cardinal Secretary of State to form a commission to study Galileo's trial that also took 11 years to reach its conclusion. The commission included no experts on Galileo, astronomy, non-Catholics, and only had two laymen to study the issue. Therefore, it was a collection of almost entirely church prelates with no expertise in the subject matter who then went on to reconvict Galileo for subverting church teachings of the day. In October 1992, John Paul thanked the commission for its work, completely ignored its findings, and issued a statement of his own imagination, blaming the Enlightenment for perpetuating the myth that the church was opposed to science and progress. A frank assessment would expose this was not actually an apology, but merely the wishful thinking of a pope eager to distance his institution from an embarrassing historical blunder. In a second example, again after years of discussion by the International Theological Commission, in 2007 the Church released a partial retraction to the idiotic conclusions that dead unbaptized babies would be condemned to hell, as derived from the doctrine of original sin formulated by Augustine. The key wording in this wishy-washy rationalization is hope, note, the italics in the document and its use in the title. The Vatican panel was apparently unable to fully repudiate a policy they had stood behind for centuries without making themselves look foolish and instead opted for optimistic phrasing, known in modern parlance as weasel wording. In referring to the babies in hell debate, in his book Letter to a Christian Nation, Sam Harris noted what a colossal waste of time these decade-long commissions are, especially given the inevitable circular justifications that will ensue and the transparent attempts to tiptoe around minefields of their own making. This is an institution that has repeatedly demonstrated that it simply cannot admit its mistakes, but must instead expend years of effort in constructing casuistic arguments to avoid losing its credibility, for an infallible church cannot err, as many of its popes have claimed over the years, and to concede that any mistake has been made would unravel the whole house of cards. Back to the 1998 Commission and its carefully crafted avoidance of responsibility for anti-Semitism. This astonishing denial, which is the official position of the Church, was obviously not aimed at anyone with access to the Internet or possessing a library card who cared to look at the numerous overtly anti-Semitic articles that appeared in Catholic newspapers and journals for several decades leading up to World War II. This unashamed attempt at rationalizing away the mass of documentary evidence to the contrary must have been aimed instead at the Catholic faithful who are obliged to believe what the Church tells them without thinking for themselves. Or, as Stephen Fry put it in this Intelligence Squared debate in 2009, It is the only owner of the truth for the billions that it likes to boast about, because those billions are uneducated and poor, as again it likes to boast about. But they are the ones it can tell and bully and domineer. I get this sense this tactic is akin to a magician's sleight of hand. Conveniently ignore the evidence over there and listen only to what we, the moral authority that is the Church, tell you. Professor David Kurtzer, an expert on Vatican history, writes in an article, This is a comforting narrative for the Church. It bears no relation to what actually happened in those fateful decades. To refute the obvious and outright fabrication of reality that is we remember, Kurtzer drafted a response in the form of his book The Popes Against the Jews, 
which documents example after example of Vatican newspapers publishing anti-Semitic articles and other incidents of Catholic complicity, such as perpetuating the myth that Jews performed ritual murder of Christian children or the blood libel, and hyping the fraudulent protocols of the elders of Zion. Kurtzer highlights the report's key passage on the rise of modern anti-Semitism in this passage of We Remember. Rather than admitting their easily demonstrable culpability, the Church blamed it on a rise in social and political nationalism occurring in many European countries during the rapid changes of modernization of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Additionally, the first line of this excerpt of We Remember carefully omits an extremely inconvenient truth for the Vatican. Jews in the Papal States did not have equal standing until the unification of Italy in 1870, when a secular government gave them equal rights and freed them from the ghettos the popes had confined them to for centuries. Presumably, the drafters of this document were counting on people's basic lack of historical awareness and hoping they could slip this through unnoticed, but it is highly embarrassing for them to have made this statement altogether given the obvious contradiction of the Jewish situation under clerical rule. Further, Kurtzer goes on to state that the Vatican newspaper had been calling for a return to the old ways to disenfranchise Jews once again, a situation which came to fruition under Mussolini with the new racial laws of 1938 that the fascists were quick to point out had their basis in the recent past under papal rule. The substance of We Remember was an attempt for the Church to distance itself from anti-Semitism, hatred of Jews for being Jews, a view which the Church disavowed. Instead, they played more casuistic word games and drew a distinction by claiming the institution had only promoted anti-Judaism, or being against the religion not the people, as demonstrated by their acceptance of Jewish converts to Catholicism. Unfortunately for this clearly Catholic propaganda, Kurtzer simply used the Vatican's own secret archives and mountains of printed evidence to the contrary to unravel the Church's narrative. Again, one must pause and wonder at the denseness of these prelates who must think society is still in the Middle Ages and people will simply take the Church at its word or that they don't have access to archival information to counter their blatant nonsense. One other issue to note is that We Remember is no longer available on the Vatican's website. If the link given in the letter from the Pope to Cardinal Cassidy on the Vatican website was changed, then why doesn't the document show up in the search results? Perhaps in the intervening decade since it was published and Kurtzer's scathing indictment of their lame attempt to whitewash their complicity in stoking anti-Semitism, they have quietly removed it even if they have not rescinded it entirely. We Remember is however available via the Wayback Machine on archive.org from years past or on other Catholic websites linked in the description. Sadly, the Church appears to have learned nothing from the horrific lessons of the Holocaust as it would take another 20 years following the end of World War II before further elements of barefaced Catholic anti-Semitism were corrected shortly before and during the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s. Immediately following World War II, Pius XII was asked to change the derogatory wording in the Catholic Good Friday Prayer for the conversion of the perfidious Jews, or faithless as it was translated in English. The Pope refused to change the wording and publicly stated the Latin perfidus means unbelieving, and one of the definitions is faithless, which can be correlated to unbelieving. However, the suggestions of its meaning as treacherous were and remain controversial and considered derogatory by Jews and many Catholics, particularly in the US and UK. It would not be until 1959 when Pope John XXIII removed the term altogether. Further changes in wording have ensued in following years to the prayer to which ultra-conservative traditionalist Catholics have strenuously objected, citing the core Catholic teaching state salvation is only found in Christ, and specifically only through the Catholic Church. One traditionalist blog discovered during my research on this issue, written as recently as 2020, calls the changes unnecessary and derides the changes made by the successive popes as merely accommodating political pressure that rejects centuries of established Catholic dogma. The prayer remains contentious in Jewish-Catholic relations as it implies that the Jews were in error to reject the promised Messiah of their own scriptures is condescending to the Jewish people and it promotes a self-righteous attitude to Catholic traditionalists who cling rigidly to an idealistic medieval past that is out of sync with the modern world. Further, at the Second Vatican Council, called by John XXIII and held between 1962 to 65, 
further changes ensued as the Pope tried to drag his obstinately out-of-date institution into the 20th century, desiring to officially change its teachings and beliefs about Jews. In October 1965, a new declaration, Nostra Aetate, in our time, was issued by the Council, which officially denounced anti-Semitism and encouraged mutual understanding and respect. Additionally, the text does not explicitly mention the traditional Christian charge against the Jews as Christ killers, but it does make a formal rejection of the belief. Finally, and rather sadly, Kurtzer cites a point made by a Jesuit church historian in 2000, noting that Civilita Catholica's century-long campaign against the Jews, observing that the journal only changed course in 1965 in the wake of the Second Vatican Council. Why it took 20 years following the Holocaust for these changes in attitude towards Jews to occur demonstrates how slow-moving the institutional church is to change and confronting its shameful history. From the examples given in this and the first four videos of this series, it is patently obvious that the Catholic Church is unwilling and or incapable of being honest about its institutional history. If you like my content, please like and subscribe to get notified of new videos. Please also consider supporting my work by becoming a Patreon sponsor. You can also find me on the following platforms.